Okay, what I want to uh, talk about first is uh, that we are not trying to set a date for the coming of Christ. Okay, I'll make that. <laughs> well, there's people that may walk out. You know, I've, I've been in the conference. People tell you things that you didn't say, so I'm trying to. Uh, so anyway, uh, we're not doing that. Okay, so what we're doing is this week of time, this is what started uh, the whole thing. I spent 10 weeks uh, just day and night, basically, trying to find out what happened to this concept because we have not heard it preached for 20 years, basically. And why haven't we? Is it a legitimate biblical concept? It is not something that Seventh-day Adventists made up. I didn't make it up. Uh, it has been around for a very long time, about 200 years prior to Christ. Uh, the Jews had this philosophy, and then I can, we'll show you later on, and we won't get there tonight, but we'll show you the Catholic leadership that have it, and the Protestant leadership that have it, and then uh, the Millerites, uh, and then our church, and most all of our forefathers believed in this, okay? And we'll show you some indiscrepancies, uh, you know, that as we go through this uh, and try to look at it and uh, see uh, what we can find out. So I had a, a member in one of my churches in Arizona that would come up to me and say, you have too many numbers in your sermons. And so I, I made this slide up just special for him. <laughs> okay, yeah, now you know, right? So we're going to hit all those. Uh, and you know a bunch of them. Uh, like I said, most of the stuff you've seen before is just how it's presented. Um, first thing we're going to do, most of everything I'm doing is scriptural. There's a little bit of Ellen White, not much, uh, but most of the time, if you see her, we've already seen the scripture that says it. She might put it in a different way so you pick it up a little better. But I found out being a pastor that if you don't know the church manual, you're in deep do and won't be a pastor very long. And you can have a manual, but if it's the 2013 and not the 2015, you're in big trouble again. So I know what the manual says, and that's why I going to show you this, because Emmanuel tells us about testing new light, okay? And this is a quote from Ellen White, uh, Volume 5 Testimonies, and it's in Emmanuel. It says, there are a thousand temptations in disguise prepared for those who have the light of truth, and the only safety for any of us is in receiving no new doctrine, no new interpretation of the scriptures without first submitting it to the brethren of experience. So how does that make you feel? Some people don't like that. You know, I want to study and just study, right? But we are a worldwide church, and so they try to make sure that whatever's said from the pulpit is together worldwide. So we don't have just people get up and they've got this idea and they're just going to do it, okay? So you're listening to policy is what you're listening to here as they're quoting Ellen White. Lay it before them in a humble, teachable spirit with earnest prayer, and if they see no light in it, yield to their judgment. Who on earth are these brethren of experience? Right? Where would you go? That's not just going to a, a rote pastor somewhere. Okay? It continues. You would think that this would you know, cut off all study, right? But this is not Ellen White. It continues, the counsel to test new light must not be regarded as deterring anyone from diligently studying the scriptures, but rather as a protection against the infiltration of false theories and erroneous doctrines into the church. When you work in the conference, you're always working with situations and problems, and you have in this conference, we have at the time about 15,000 people, and there's always something going on somewhere, okay? And you're men of experience. Uh, I took what you're going to see tonight, to the president of the Arizona Conference. And um, the reason why is those guys, if they're good, they know what's going on in all their churches. Uh, they know their pastors. They know the leadership. They know whether it's a conservative church or a liberal church. They know the biggest problems that have just happened in that church. And guess what? They also have conference friends, other presidents that they know. 
and they have people on the unions that they know. And if there's anything new that has come into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they know it. Okay, and so they have dealt with all this stuff. So each one of these guys that I work for brought in four to 500 people into the church themselves through Bible studies. That's how they got to be presidents, is because they were out there really reaching people. So that's why I went to Ed Keyes. This continues. Let no one come to the conclusion that there is no more truth to be revealed. This is Ellen White again. We have seen only the glimmering of the divine glory and the infinitude of knowledge and wisdom. We have, as it were, been working on the surface of the mind when rich golden ore, I like that part because of what I like to go do, is beneath the surface to reward the one who will dig for it. The shaft must be sunk deeper and yet deeper in the mind and will result will be glorious treasure. Okay? So, we took it to Ed Keyes. I was, in, I was on the, uh, the uh, finance committee and the uh, school board, Thunderbird, and also on one which we were trying to figure out what to do with the land of Thunderbird, around Thunderbird. And so I was at a meeting, and I just said, I'm going to make an appointment with you. And he said, what do you got? And I said, well, so I kind of went through it, and he said, oh, that sounds really good. And uh, so he allowed me to do it. And then a couple of weeks later, I was at more meetings, and he came by. And uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm still working on this thing. I got some more stuff. And he goes, really, what do you got? And so he came over, and, and I was really tickled because he was late to his next meeting by 20 minutes. <laughs> so, so we had him for a little while. Uh, so anyway, uh, this is, we'll kind of give you these numbers again. Four is connected to the covenant that Christ made with Adam and Eve. Six is connected to the uh, mankind. It's the number of man. And uh, 600 is connected to the flood. Um, 6,000 to the second coming of Christ. 40 to the flood again. 400 to Abraham and the Passover. 4,000 to uh, the crucifixion of Christ and the story of Lazarus. Seven, of course, we're dealing with a week of time. We have seven, the perfect number. You have two perfect numbers times each other. And you have two perfect numbers times ten. Ten, if you time any number by ten, it, it makes it complete. Okay? Now, look at the, some of the numbers you have up there. You have four times ten is forty. Ten times forty is four hundred. Ten times four hundred is four thousand. These numbers mean things. Okay? Uh, 7 times 7 is 49, which ties you to what? Jubilee. Okay, you say, oh no, Jubilee is 50. Well, when you count Jubilees, 50 happens to be the first year of the next Jubilee. So the 50th year that they celebrate really is the first year of the next 49. So if you go to add them up, it's 49, 49, 49, 49. The last Jubilee will be 50, okay, because there isn't another Jubilee coming. This one, 7 times 7 times 10, is 490, which, of course, is the 70 weeks of Daniel. And this one down here will get to several weeks from now. Okay, but you see, there's a pattern. 7, 7 times 7, times 7 times 7 times 10, and 7 times 7 times 7 times 10. So it's just kind of interesting how the numbers all work. Stay awake and watch for what? No man knows a day or hour. Do we know when Christ is coming? Okay, that's the normal answer we get. All right? Because of that right there. No one knows it's their hour. There is also just a few texts out there that say, watch out, there's a thief about. Right? What's it say? He comes as a thief in the night. Do you know when the thief is coming? No, so obviously we don't know when he's coming. Well, uh, we'll show you some things. Okay? We know it's not a secret, like the secret rapture. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. We know that when this thing starts, it's going to be a worldwide event. Now, there's two types of people in the Bible. Who is the Bible written for? Sinners, okay, humans, okay. Are there ever any messages to the righteous? Only. Are there messages to the wicked? Only. Okay, so the righteous 
And the wicked are two types of people, the righteous win, the wicked do not. Would you say that the righteous are more informed than the wicked are? Depending on what it would be, right? About the future, are the righteous informed? Yeah, they are. We've given prophets to tell us what's coming. The wicked are not informed. They're flying off the seat of their pants for what they've been taught, what they've discovered in their own experience. The righteous know when the coming is near. Would you agree with that? Okay, all right. So when the coming is near, the wicked have, do not know. They don't have the slightest clue. All right. The only restriction we have when we're looking into last day events and looking at Christ because we're told to watch, right? The only restriction is the one we already did. No one knows the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father. Now, this could lead us to something else. Can you speed up his coming? Does, does he know the day and hour? Or does he go, oh, man, they sped the coming up. Now we gotta, we got to change it. You know, everything's different now. Can we delay it? Okay, and does he know when that is? Does he know that you'll contribute to it or not? Okay, he'll, he knows, so he knows the day and hour, right? I mean, he's got it, right? Would you, would you, and, and by the way, this is question and answer. I'm not going to be preaching, okay? So, and I'm not going to sit there and tell you I have all the answers either. So uh, I'll listen. I may go put your stuff in the next presentation. <laughs> okay? All right. In the future, <clears throat> this is 2 Peter 3.10. We're going to look at this a lot tonight. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. There are six of these. Interesting, it's the number of man that we have. Six of these texts. Watch out. This one we're also going to look at a little bit more. This is Paul and Thessalonians. Now, brothers, about times and dates. We do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, wait a minute. Where's destruction? Who's going to have that destruction happen to them? The wicked. Is it the wicked that aren't going to know when he's coming? Is these messages to the wicked or to the righteous or to everybody? Which is it? Here's another one. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. Who would that be? The righteous, right? Obey and repent. Okay, you're talking to people, obey and repent. If you do that, you're righteous. But if you do not wake up, the wicked, I will come like a thief. All right, now wait a minute. We've had a whole bunch of texts that say he's going to come like a thief. This is clear. This is to the wicked, isn't it? I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. All right. Here's another one, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So if you're watching, you will know, right? Now, I'm not saying you're going to know the day and hour. I told you that was the one restriction we have, right? And it reminds me of a little story. There was a guy that uh, heard noise down in this in his kitchen and dining room area, he had a bedroom upstairs, and he came and he started down the stairs, and there was a thief down there. And the thief all at once saw him, and he's scared for a minute, and the guy goes, would you please stay right there? My wife's been waiting for you for 20 years. <laughs> 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 so you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him, if you're not ready, okay? Now, if you're studying this kind of stuff and you're watching and you're studying last day events and you're doing it to catch the last trolley out, you're going to miss it because this thing says, be ready. Okay? All right. Revelation, behold, I come quick, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake 
and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. So if you stay awake and you're watching, you don't have to worry about the rest of this. With power and great glory, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear. With a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this manner, what kind of people ought you to be? And this is talking about not trying to get the last trolley out. You ought to be, uh, to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God, and speed is coming. Now there's the text some of us were dealing with earlier. Can we speed the coming? And if we do, does the Lord know we're going to do that or not? And they refer to delays also. Ellen White said we could have come air on this. He could have, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, but this, the, I don't know when the first day the snow snow is, snow, but okay. I think it's going to happen on the day. Okay, the, the text says day and hour. The, the, the world of the message has gone to all the world. Well, no, it, it says when he comes. Well, I guess if you're going to connect it to when he comes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he knows the beginning from the end. Yeah. Well, you know, let's, let's look at that for a minute. Uh, can we delay this thing? Uh, I read a little thing that says the rocks will cry out. You know, uh, it sounds to me like I like to think of it. And again, I'm not trying to throw anybody a thing on anybody because I, what I want to do, I want people to think. Okay. Uh, if he, I believe that if he knows a day or hour and he knows everything from beginning to end, he's Alpha and Omega, he knows it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm going to go about an hour tonight. If you want to stay, I don't, you know, if somebody wants to leave, I don't want to have people feel like they're going to miss something or whatever. So we're, we'll work on that a little bit on the time. Okay? That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven, a new home. Uh, a new earth in the home of the righteous. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Be alert. Now, Mark doesn't say anything about a thief. The others have all, Matthew, Luke, John, and Paul, have all mentioned this thief thing. He puts it this way, be on your guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So we're watching and we're not sleeping because we're looking for the owner of the house to come back. And if you're doing those things, you're going to know when the owner of the house comes back. You're looking out the window, you know the car, you see it coming. You know, or he's coming in a taxi, he tells you that, you see it coming down the street, he comes and we have a text that says, you will know when he's even at the door. That's pretty close, right? All right, now we have some watch texts here to go through. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know what day the Lord will come. Another one, be always on watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. All right, so I've, I've talked about this a lot. I've been a guy that was into last day events. And there are people that say, you know, they don't even study this. You know, what they, just, you know, praise the Lord and celebrate and worship. Yeah, this says over and over again to watch, to be alert, 
Don't fall asleep. This is part of the process that we need to be watching and paying attention. So if I stay up and keep watch, then what? What am I watching for? Now, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, if you've ever been to an evangelistic series, this is where they go. Okay? And we know all these, right? And I put them, some of them have some things in them that are the same as the other books. Some of them have unique stuff in them. Just so that we're giving you a background, we're going to rapidly go through these, all right? Many will come claiming I am the Christ. There will be wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, and pestilence. There will be fearful events and great signs from heaven. The love of many will grow cold. You will be betrayed by close relatives. All men will hate you. You will be handed over to local councils, flogged in synagogues, and put in prison. You will stand before governors and kings and will be persecuted and put to death. There will be days of distress unequaled. False Christ will appear here and there. Remember that event with Jones? One of my members at uh, Coolidge found the bodies. So his day Adventist stumbled across all this stuff. And false prophets will do great miracles. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world. And then will the end come. This is what we're told in the evangelistic series. This is what they go through with them, showing the prophecies. These are all things we watch for, and we all know this if you've been in the church long. We all know all this stuff, okay? And some of these are signs, and they are stuff. When Before Righteousness by Faith came out, uh, they talked about the second coming all the time. And the newspaper, there was an earthquake! And it got to be so bad that you really didn't want them to do that anymore because it's just same old thing, same old thing. Now we don't hear much about second coming. You know, we don't hear a lot of talk from it uh, up front much because we're all into righteousness by faith in Christ. And that message that went. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, even at the door. So the things we just listed, when you see all this stuff, we have seen most of it. Okay, of what we just went through, okay? Now, very rapidly, my whole point is, I want you to understand that this thing is about to end. Where are we in this vision? We're in the feet, right? Where are we in this vision? We're at the beast, the little horn, and the, uh, the whole thing with the church there. Where are we in this vision? The little horn again, and judgment. Where are we in this one? 2,300 years, we've gotten past that one. The, the 70 weeks comes out of that. It's cut out of the 2,300. King of the North, King of the South, that terminology is used in chapter 11 at the beginning of the chapter, and then in the middle it kind of wanders off, and then verses 40 to 45, it pops up again. We have no clue, ladies and gentlemen, what those last five chapters, uh, verses are. We still don't. Okay, I know that table talk on 3BN, those guys have taken some shots at it. Seventh-day Adventist Church has nothing on 40 through 45 of Daniel 11. Right? Revelation. Christ is walking among the candlesticks, and it represents the seven churches. We have seven seals. We have seven trumpets. We are in the seventh church. We're at the sixth seal. We're at the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet and the seventh seal have to do with the second coming of Christ. So we've been through most all of those. We have, of course, the story of the fall, the war in heaven. We have the beast, the scarlet beast, that it goes after the woman that has seven heads and ten horns. And we've been past that. We've got this beast that comes out that technically it has no color. It has skin of a leopard and feet of a bear and head of a lion. And it's called the beast. It has seven heads and ten horns, just like the red dragon has. And then the beast with the lamb-like horns. Here's where we are. And we have a three angels' messages. We're doing those right now. This one, Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, lest ye share in her sins and receive of her plagues. We have not preached this. We have not started to preach this. One of the reasons why I'm looking into what I'm looking into and what we're studying this whole thing for is you cannot preach that message unless you know where you are. Because if you preach that to me, 
uh, come out of her, my people, that you, that you share not in her sins, receive her plagues. You know what I want to focus on? What plagues are you talking about? That's where I'm going. I don't want those things. What plagues are they? And you're going to say, the seven last plagues. And I'm going to say, when are they going to happen? I don't know. And that's the end of your message. Nobody's going to listen to you anymore. You need to know where we are in time to be able to preach that. We have not preached it. What's the next thing in Revelation 19? The second coming. And we've gone through every major prophecy out there. We're at the end of every last one of them. This was interesting to me, the Lisbon quake. Now, if you go to Revelation 6, John is talking about, he gives you a list of things to look at. The Lisbon earthquake comes up in 1755. If you go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they start their stuff with persecution stops, which happened in 1775. And then both of them have the same thing for the next, it won't be exactly how this pops up, but it's this, the sun darkened, the moon turned to blood, stars fall, and the shaking of the heavens. Okay? These two prophecies are intertwined. So you've got Revelation 6, and then you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then you've got three things, the sun, moon, and stars, and the shaking of the heavens. Okay, have you ever heard people tell you that that sun, moon, and stars is going to happen again? How do you do that? These are tied together. What are you going to move with it? Uh, are we going to have uh, another big earthquake? Why are you just picking the sun, the moon, and the stars? And, and one of the things that people say, well, you know, that, that sun darkening and the moon turning to blood, that was a big fire. There was a huge fire up in the, in the east of the part of the United States. Well, uh, we live, my wife and I live down in Arizona, and we live six miles from the largest forest fire ever hit Arizona. And we, it burned for 45 days. Now remember, it's the sun darkens and the moon turns to blood. Do you know what happens to a sun when you're in the middle of a forest fire? It turns red. I have pictures of shadows on my grass that are bright red. Okay, so it's not a forest fire. All right? Now let's look at the rest of this. The beast with the lamb-like horns. This is the United States, 1776. And right after it gets started, the sun darkens and the moon turns to blood. Uh, if you go to the dates, just get online, go to those dates, you can read headlines of the papers, and they all knew it was this. I mean, the papers are all saying this. 1,260 years of the beast that ends in 1798, and then it talks about this beast with the lamb-like horns coming up, 1776. We were just starting to take off in 1798. The stars fall in 1833. There are some people who believed that the shaking of the heavens has to do with the stars falling. It does not. And in fact, the, uh, Luke, when he lists out the sun, moon, and stars, and then it says the shake of the heavens in Matthew, Mark, and John, Luke says the sun, moon, and stars, and he has two or three more verses. Then he says the shaking of the heavens. And here's what happens with our believers. The next line is, and this generation shall not pass. Uh, Harvey, uh, oh, shoot, I forgot his name. How can I do that? Anyway, he was a principal of Monterey Bay Academy for years. And he came out to Hawaii, and he was a principal out there with me at, uh, at Hawaii Mission Academy. And I came in one day, and I was doing, I was showing him, because he knew his Bible really well, and so I was showing him all this stuff. It wasn't this. It was on Revelation 17. I was showing him all this stuff I had, and he goes, oh, a little William Miller. <laughs> and, and I go, okay, well, whatever. And so he told, me, he told me what happened, that they kept track of everybody that saw the stars, okay, because they thought the shaking of the heavens and the stars were together. And he said, you know, that prophecy is good till the last cow comes home. And they tracked everybody that saw those stars because the next thing should have been this generation shall not pass. It didn't happen, okay, because the shaking of the heavens was not included with the stars, okay? Fall of the Ottoman Empire, that's one that you don't hear a lot about. It's a prophecy about an hour a day, a month, and a year. And uh, look at the dates. Notice we're getting close to 1844. This is why people were excited about 1844. That's why William Miller's message went worldwide, because you could sit here and list all this stuff out. And when it gets to 
this Ottoman Empire thing, Josiah Leach figures it out in 1839. Two years before the event happens, the Ottoman Empire uh, yielded its power to Christian nations, and that's what it's referencing. And he figures that out, and on August 9, he figures out the day, and it hits, and you talk about excited people. You know, and then what's William Miller doing? He's preaching 1844, the Lord's coming. So this thing just set people on fire. It was going everywhere. Of course, the next thing is 1844. The thing we do not have, Revelation 17. Does anybody know what Revelation 17 is about? It's about the woman riding on the beast, right? Let me tell you a little secret. My dad, we had his Bible book from when he was in eighth grade. And I had my Bible book when I was in eighth grade. And, and the eighth graders, they study Revelation, at least back in the day they did. And there's chapters of Revelation, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 19, 20, 21, and 22. We skip 17 and 18. We still don't know what those things are about. Uriah Smith, in his book, he ha you've seen the book, Daniel Revelation, Uriah Smith's big fat thing. You ever read it? It takes forever to read it. When you get to Revelation 17, there are four pages. One of them is just the text. The other one is a picture, and there's two pages of explanation, and Ellen White disagrees with them. <laughs> Ellen White stuff, there's about two sentences on that chapter. So we don't really know a whole lot about that chapter. We don't know about uh, Revelation 18. And that's the one where it says that Babylon, the main part of it is that Babylon uh, is destroyed. And the first thing it says is a day. And then it says the captains and the sailors and the kings all mourn for Babylon because she's destroyed in an hour. We don't really know what that's talking about. Okay? So there's some areas here that we don't know. Heaven's shaking. Uh, if I had lots of time, we could go through, because Ellen White, when she uh, comments in Desire of Ages on the sun, the moon, and the stars, it's fascinating what she does, because uh, when she does it, then she comes back. She writes the text down, and she comes back and says, we knew the sun, the moon, and the stars, and she drops it, shaking the heavens. But she writes Desire of Ages, and I can't remember, I'll probably get it mixed up, but one of them 10 years before she writes Great Controversy. In Great Controversy, she states what the shaking of the heavens were. In Desire Ages, she didn't know it. And so she herself didn't understand how this thing all plays out. But if you go to the time of trouble, uh, that chapter, you can go through and you can find out what the plagues are. Okay? And the plagues will keep you. They kind of give you a, a map so that you can see whether or not anything else coming in is coming in at the wrong time. So she mentions, are the plagues, the seven last plagues, are they universal or not? Do you know? They're not universal, right? She says that if they were not. If they were universal, they wiped out all men. But it's the first four she says that on, not the last three. Okay, and you can get the last three right off of the front page of God's People Delivered, which is the next chapter. And... Uh, uh, it talks about the, um, see, I wasn't prepared to do this. I get wondering, you know, if I'll do this a lot, just go somewhere where I wasn't planning to go. Uh, let's see, the, seven, the sixth plague is the river Euphrates dries up, and the seventh plague is shaking the heavens, and what is the fifth one? I don't remember. I don't remember what the fifth one is. But anyway, they're all listed right there. They're on the very first page. I don't remember what the first, the fifth one is, but the sixth one is the river Euphrates dry up, okay? Then it says uh, that God says it is done and the heavens shake. She has it right there. And the reason for the text, it says, and this generation shall not pass is because the next five or six pages of great controversy in that chapter describes the earth literally falling apart. And so that is a promise to that generation that they make it through that mess, okay? So anyway, we have not seen the heaven shake, and we have not seen this apostate religion yet come up, okay? That woman riding on the beast. Uriah Smith, he says that just like a man would ride upon a horse and control that horse, this woman is riding on this beast. It's a beast, 
Okay? You ever see an old Western? The drunk guy comes out of the bar, and he comes over, and he gets on the horse, but it's not his horse. It's an unbroken horse. <laughs> and he's going, who's controlling the rider? Who's controlling who? Uriah Smith says, just like a man would control a horse. This woman is drunk on top of it all, right? She's drunk with the blood of the saints. Who's controlling who here? So it looks like his whole explanation isn't accurate, right? Anyway, I give you some of that stuff. The end will be like this. Now, we have two scenarios that we talk about what the end will be like. What are they? I just gave it away. Lot, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, and planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. So it's giving us this illustration to tell us what's going to happen. Now notice, righteous and the wicked. Lot's the righteous one with his family. He leaves. Why is that? He's informed. Okay? The rest of them don't because they're not informed. Who's the other one that we have? Another illustration. We all know this, right? As it was in the days of Noah, it was, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking. For some reason, the Lord has this thing about eating and drinking. We all eat and drink. Okay. <clears throat> Marrying and giving in marriage. Up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came. So they didn't know that the flood was coming and took them all away. Who is it? It's the wicked. They didn't know. Okay, where were the righteous? They're in a boat. Okay, this is how it will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now this, I told you, we go into this text a little bit more. This is Paul. He initially said that he comes as a thief in the night. Now look at this. You don't hear this quoted much. But you, brothers are not in darkness, so that that day should surprise you like a thief. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. Righteous folks are not going to be surprised by this. It, she just said so. Okay? All right, let's look a little more depth into these two stories. The two men said to Lot, did you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone in the city who you belong to? Get them out of here. Interesting if this is about last day events. Notice the angels didn't go out and do the work. We have something to go do. We're supposed to be notifying people. Letting people know that this is about to happen. Because we're going to destroy this place. He All at once, he knows. He's got two angels with him. He knows that. And he just told them they're going to destroy it. He knows it's going to be destroyed. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great, he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry, get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. Maybe he was a real jokester, and they thought, ha, ah, that's good, you're not going to get us on this one. And when the coming of the dawn, guess what? Lot knows the hour. We aren't going to know the hour. It says we won't, but he did. With the coming of the dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. What's going on? His daughters aren't going anywhere. Their husbands aren't going. Now, I'm just making this up. They're weeping and crying somewhere. Who do you suppose mom was with? The daughters, dad's doing what? We got to get out of here. We aren't going anywhere. You're crazy. And they can't decide. They can't get out of there. Nobody can make a decision. So what happens when he hesitates? The men grasp his hand in the hands of his wife and his two daughters and lead them out safely uh, out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. This is how it's going to be. It's a second coming. Do you suppose the angels are going to show up and help people who are struggling with the right decisions at that time? Maybe so. That's interesting, isn't it? 
Will all those people go? Maybe not. Will they recognize the angel? I don't even know. You know, we don't have anything that says that that'll happen. I'm just going off the story. You know, Ellen White doesn't tell us anything about angels showing up and helping. But if the Lord sent his son to die for us and there's people on the edge still, you would think that they're going to pull all the stops to help get them out. But I don't have a thing other than that story to say that. Okay? As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your wives, lives. Do not look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee the mountains or you'll be swept away. Now we're going to look at Noah. Methuselah. What does Methuselah mean? What's his name mean? Okay, when I die, we'll be sent, kind of a concept, right? Okay. His name meant when I die, it will be sent. I must be right. Look at there. It said it right there. <laughs> All right. What can you learn, learn from a genealogy? I was trying to memorize Genesis, and I got to the genealogy and quit. <clears throat> but I learned some things. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methusel, uh, Methuselah, and Lamech, and Noah. Here's their ages. Okay. Now, Methuselah, you'll know right away if you don't know that he was the oldest man to ever live, 969 years. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, well, we have it up there. Take it to heaven. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I'll go for that. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, so. Methuselah, except for his father, uh, he lives 969 years. All right. Now, I used to feel bad for the antediluvians. And this is why. And maybe I don't read it right. The Lord said that, that Noah was righteous, right? He said he was a righteous man. What does Noah do when he gets out of the ark and, and he goes and he, he sacrifices the Lord? And then what's he do? Yeah, he goes down to 7-Eleven and buys a whole bunch of six-packs. <laughs> okay, he made it. Does that make you feel better? He knew how to make it. Now, I don't know if that meant he wasn't righteous anymore. Do you suppose he ever did that before the flood? So Noah's saying that the Lord told him to build this big boat. You mean the drunk guy? Okay, so how did they know to believe this guy? How, how do you know? I mean, I used to go, God, they didn't have a shot at it. Okay, things are going along, and Methuselah shows up, and he hits 962, and he ties with Jared. Everybody knows that, because Jared was the oldest man to ever live. And as soon as that happens, they know, and they know what his name means. Who is his dad? Enoch, the prophet. The prophet names him this. What's this guy's grandson doing? He's saying a flood's coming. They had to know. They had to know. And then when the animals all wash onto the ark, they should have been there in line. So I felt better about it. You can plug that picture into any one of those people you want to plug that into. <laughs> Now, I am a numbers guy, so this means absolutely nothing, but I'm a numbers guy. Who, who didn't make it to 800? Lamech didn't make it to 800. Isn't that weird? He dies at 777. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, man. <laughs> Here's what's weird about it. Methuselah, how much longer does he live than Jared? Seven years. Who's eating? Enoch is the seventh from Adam. How much longer did Jared not live? The, the, isn't that just weird? It's just weird. I don't know what it means, but it's just, you know, when you memorize stuff, it messes you all up. You're going to sit around <laughs> doing this. All right, let's go on. What did the righteous know? The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Okay, this is Genesis 7, 1. So he tells him to go in Genesis 7, 1. 
In 7.8, it says, Pairs of clean and unclean animals, the birds and all the creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God has commanded. Now, it also says that Noah went out and collected some animals prior to that. I'm not sure which ones he collected, but this says that they, a bunch of them came in on their own. 7.13, on that very day, Noah and his sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, together with their wives, and the wives of the three sons entered the ark. Then the Lord shut him in. Now, if you haven't seen the days of Noah, go see it. It's, I mean, get the, get the videos. It's really good. It's a great, great, great thing. Another neat thing on the last days. Genesis 7, 4. I didn't remember this. Lots of people don't remember this. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I'll wipe on the face of the earth, every living creature I have made. Noah knew the day it was going to happen. Lot knew the hour it was going to happen. The righteous knew. Okay? We're not going to know the day and hour when the Lord comes. But we shouldn't be surprised if we're watching, if we're staying awake, if we're paying attention. This should not come as a big surprise to the righteous. Great Conoverse. Now, this is one of my Ellen White then. I don't have a lot of Ellen White statements, but you've seen all the texts and stuff, so you're going to know that she's verified in what she's saying. Though no man knoweth the day nor hour of his coming, we are instructed, watch, stay awake, awake, don't go to sleep. We are instructed and required to know when it is near. You are required to know that. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. Okay? We've got to know this. We've got to continue to watch. We've got to continue to study. Thessalonians, now, brothers, about times and dates, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that day should surprise you like a thief. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. All right. We'll go into this. Any questions, by the way? Anybody have any questions on anything you've seen so far? Most of the stuff you've seen already, all right? All right, I'm trying to give you background that we're in the final throes of this thing. Every vision out there is coming to an end. We've lived through it. Uh, how close are we to this? Okay, we have been preaching for 156 years of the soon return of Christ. Paul thought it was going to happen in his day. So did Peter. So did most of the disciples. Martin Luther was hoping it was going to happen in his day. Uh, my grandfather bought a Pontiac in 1955. It would be the last car he buys till the Lord comes, he told everybody. Well, oops, he bought a few more cars since then. When's this thing over? How many more years do we keep on saying the coming is soon, the coming is soon? Are we going to know someday that we're in these final days? So I want to tell you about the 2300 days, and there's several reasons why. Uh, <clears throat> one reason is that many Adventists are embarrassed with the fact that we came out of the Millerite movement and they were wrong. Okay? It's embarrassing. So we went back and we studied a lot so we could save our face. Uh, I want to show you that's not the case. In 1590, 1581, and 1730, the Jesuits Francisco Ribera, Cardinal Robert Bellamine, and Manuel Lacunza believed that the 2300 days did not matter because the Antichrist would come at the end of time. Okay? So they got everybody looking way out somewhere to the end of time to the Antichrist. The view that Jesuit, the Jesuit Louis de Alcazar, Alcazar promoted was that 2,300 evenings and mornings, or 1,150 literal days, applied to Antiochus Epiphanes, the eighth king of Greece. Notice what they've just done between the latter part of the 1500s and the uh, uh, first part of the 1700s. 
They have taken the view of the Catholic Church being the Antichrist and the beast, and they've got you looking past on both sides. This was called contra-Protestantism. It was designed to destroy the Protestant world. And because what were they doing? The beast and the Antichrist is the Pope. Okay? So these Jesuits set out to give this illustration. Now, I don't know if you've ever dealt with anybody, but you notice that the 2,300 days, they are only going to count 1,150 days because it says 2,300 evenings and mornings. It doesn't say 2,300 days. So I have 1,150 evenings and I have 1,150 mornings. If I add them together, it's 2,300 evenings and mornings. Here's how you mess them up. How many evenings and mornings are there in 2,300 days? 2,300. You've just blown them out of the water. Okay? And if you're going to do that, then when you get it down to 1,150 literal days, well, those days have evenings and mornings. And so maybe we should cut it in half again. Hey, this is just, this is lunacy. And they point you to Antiochus Epiphanes. When you're looking at the prophecies, it's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then the eighth king of Greece. Really? Oh, he's greater than, if you take the king of James, it's greater, greater, greatest. Notice in the NIV, they dropped that language. Because in the NIV, it's all about Antiochus. Okay? And funny enough, since he was supposed to be the great the greatest. His father's name is Antiochus the Great. He's not even the great. Okay? So this whole thing is crazy. I had a pastor in one of my churches, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, retired, who is preaching this in the Sabbath school class in the back room. What do you have to do to preach this? you got to get rid of Ellen White. You know who's visiting all of our visitors when they come here? He is. I know, because I had visitors come and say, you know that man, you know what he's saying? And our church would not let us stop that. Isn't that odd? It's different. That church went from the largest church I had to the smallest church I had. The Lord's not going to bring in new members and have them deal with that. Okay, let's go to the Protestants. The early Protestant reformers who studied the prophecies of Daniel 7 through 9 believed that the millennium would start in 1843. That sounds familiar, 1843, 1844. They're not right. So it wasn't just the Millerites. These guys were dead wrong. William Miller believed that Christ would come in 1843, and then they moved it to 1844. Why? Because there's a zero in between 1 B.C. and 1 A.D., there is no zero. But in math, there's a zero. So if you go to do your mathematics, you got to have to deal with that. So they came up with 1844. Now here's the interesting part. Christ would come before the millennium, which was right. The Millerites were right. The Protestants were dead wrong. So he was more right than the Protestants were. Okay? Looking at January 1, 1843, so this is before 1844. All the options in Christendom to interpret the 2300 days are all wrong. Everybody. Not just Millerites. One Protestant forefather believed the judgment would begin about 300 years after him. It was this man, Martin Luther. Now this is all reference. And all you got to do really is know Ellen White said this in Great Controversy, but she's quoting James White's incident in connection with the Advent movement as illustrated by the Three Angels message of 1818, translated by H. Bell, page 7 and 8, because it was in German, Revelation 14, 1868, the familiar discourse of Dr. Martin Luther. And here's a statement. I hope the last day of judgment is not far. I persuade myself barely. It will not be absent full 300 years longer. The judgment. Let's see. He's born in 1843. He dies in 1546. Add 300 years to 1546, and what do you get? 1846. Let's see. That's pretty close to 1844, isn't it? Okay? It gets better than that. Watch. On January 1, 1849, five years after the Great Disappointment, 
of October 22, 1844, what choices are left? How are we going to interpret this? Concerning the 2300-day prophecy, so we'll give you every potential choice there is. Here's the first one. The date and the event were wrong. People threw the Bible out and didn't believe anymore. Thousands did that. Thousands. How about this one? The date and the event were right. Jesus had come on October 22, 1844. Jesus had come into the hearts and minds of his followers. They're called the spiritualizers. Do you like that choice? I don't like that choice very well. How about this one? The date was wrong and the event was right. Christ was coming again, but we need to set a new date. They were called Albany Adventists and they set a new date. 1845, 1846, 1847, 1848, 1849, 1850, 1855, 1880 something, and 1890 something. You know when Ellen White says there's no more time prophecies? She's talking to those people. Miller died about five years after 1844. And Joshua Himes uh, left the Adventists. And uh, when he got older, he got cancer and reunited at Battle Creek Sam and was with, with the Adventists again. I didn't say that he joined them, but he was with them once more when he died at Battle Creek Hospital. Here's another one, a new kind of religion. A concept was developed, dispensationalism, the rapture, the seven years of tribulation. Look at this. The small horn of Daniel 8 is Antiochus Epiphanes, and the small horn of Daniel 7 is the Antichrist. Does that sound familiar to anyone? The Jesuits, it only took them about three or 400 years, and they've destroyed Protestantism because Protestants are all going back to the mother church. There's no reason to fear them because it's Antiochus and it's the Antichrist. So the date was right. The event was wrong. October 22, 1844, the date was correct but needed to be relooked at, at the event, the cleansing of the sanctuary. They found a lot of scriptures on the subject, discovered the cleansing of the sanctuary was symbolic of the beginning of the judgment. And by the way, did you know when they got the October 22 date, you know how close they got to the truth? Where did they get that October 22 date? Because that didn't happen until about two weeks. William Miller didn't accept it until about two weeks before October 22. Where did they get it from? They went to the Jews. What was the Yom Kippur date for 1844? The cleansing of the sanctuary was October 22. That's where they got it from. If they would have known that the festival of the Yom Kippur, the judgment, had to do with judgment and that the Festival of Tabernacles had to do with the second coming, which was five days later, they'd have had it. They were looking in the right places, but they didn't connect all the little dates here. All right, so they're finding these things, and uh, Daniel 7 says, as I looked, thrones were set in place. The Ancient of Days took his seat, thousands upon ten thousands stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. So there's our picture of investigative judgment. Daniel 7, 13, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days which was in the court and was led into his presence. So between October 23, the next day after the great disappointment in 1844, 1844 and February 7, 1846, Hiram Edison, O.R.L. Crozier, and Dr. Franklin B. Hahn were men responsible for studying together for a year and four months after the great disappointment. They started, this, they started with this concept that it would be a while before Christ could complete the cleansing of the sanctuary. Okay, so he can't come because it's going to take him some time. That's where they started. They didn't end up there. And not until then would he come forth as king. Their conclusion was written by Crozier in the Day Star Extra, February 7, 1846. 1846, ring a bell. 1546, it was exactly 300 years 
before men understood this concept. And Martin Luther said, I hope it's not 300 years. Okay, so he's right on the money. The biblical study became the basis of the sanctuary doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the only unique, original doctrine we have. Right? You all know this. Here's something you didn't know, I'll bet. It included the predictive nature of the Sabbaths, which would be the festivals, of the Jewish economy. Spring, Sabbath typified the events surrounding the first advent of Christ, Passover, Festival of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. We all know this. The fall Sabbaths, a feast typifying the events connected with the second advent, Festival of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Festival of Tabernacles. And here's what you probably didn't know because I didn't know it. I'm fairly normal. And the great Sabbath, the seventh millennium, what is that? It was in that doctrine. It was in his report. What is it? It's the final millennium of the week of time. It's in our only unique doctrine we have. Right in the report. I got the report of Crozier and I read it. The last day of the great week of time. What is the great week of time? Uh, the testimony of the pioneers regarding the great week of time. I don't know if you remember Ed Reed. He wrote a lot of books before the year 2000. He was a minister and a, uh, a lawyer. He was a stewardship director for the GC for a while. He wrote a book called uh, Even at the Door, which was one of his first ones. I was reading all these books. Anything that came out from anybody, I was reading all these books. He has a triple affirmation by vision from Ellen White on what Crozier and those guys wrote. In a statement written in April of 1847, Ellen White records a triple affirmation of Crozier, Ed Edison's, and Hahn's research. Ellen writings, historical prologue number 15, uh, 19. Numbers in the parentheses are, are un underlined and are, are added. The Lord showed me in vision, okay, so she's in vision, more than one year ago that Brother Crozier had the true light on the cleansing of the sanctuary, including the reference to the week of time. And that he, it was God's will that Brother Crozier should write out that view, which he gave us in the day star extra, February 7, 1846. I feel fully authorized by the Lord to recommend that extra to every saint. So folks, it's in the one unique doctrine we have. What happened to it? How come we don't hear about it anymore? Uh, is it still valid? Does it have anything for us to even think about? Okay. I think we're going to stop here, if that's all right, unless people want to go on. Does anybody want to go on? <laughs> okay. One, all right. A couple of people, all right. Uh, I don't want to, unless, do you, do you want to go another 10 minutes? Is that, will that bother everybody? Okay, we'll go another 10 and then we'll quit. All right. Thus, finding of the Bible, the Bible scholars were confirmed by the vision of God's messenger. So what is a week of time? A day, a month, and a year are measured by the sun, moon, and stars. Okay? The week is not measured by anything. So if one of your friends says that he'll see you next Tuesday, he is using the creation story. There's no reason for a seven-day week. Right? Is it possible that the week measures something, perhaps how long sin uh, is going to be, man's, probo man's probation and the judgment, how long that would all last? Is that possible? In a book called The Woman, the Beast, and the Book of Revelation by Wurr, who was a pastor in Australia, wrote the book in 1953 or so, one of the best books I've ever read on this kind of stuff. He's saying that, this is not a quote, but 6,000 years for false religion, sin and rebellion, the 7,000th year for God's day of judgment, the Sabbath millennium. Babylon's followers are destroyed. After 6,000 years, they remain dead during the 7,000th year. Okay, it seems to match the fourth commandment. Six days thou shalt labor. Men will labor in sin and sorrow and suffering for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath that they will spend with the Lord after he comes at the end of the 6,000th year. 
with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. Second Peter. David says something very similar. He says, for a day in your course is better than a thousand. But he doesn't say a thousand what? He has another quote, David does, where he says, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. If this cannot be applied to the week of time where a day represents a thousand years, there is no week of time. And our doctrine on the judgment hour has a big flaw in it. Okay? And I don't know if we'll get that far tonight, but we're going to look. I, I believe in the SDA, SDA Bible Commentary. I use it. It was written by 50 guys in the 1950s, and it goes through every text in the Bible. And it's good stuff. These guys are experts. They're, they're uh, men who are great theologians. But they uh, don't follow that this should be used as any kind of a measurement at all. Okay? And when I was uh, working in the conference office, and like I said, I was the last day of Vince Nutt. I studied Revelation 17 for 20 years trying to figure out what was there. And so I get a hold of any pastor, the poor man, if he was kind at all, he'd sit and have to listen to me drill him on, on everything I knew. And I and I find out that the majority of the pastors would tell you that the day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. That just means that God's time is different than ours. Okay? Little problem. The line right in front of it says, don't forget this. And it's referencing scoffers who are saying, where is this coming? We don't believe in the creation. We don't believe in the flood. We don't believe in the judgment. Where is this coming? It's been the same as it always has been. And the response is, don't forget this. A day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. How does that respond to scoffers? What does that mean? It certainly doesn't mean that God has different times than we do, because if I said that to you, you want to know this, God has different times than we do. Oh, okay. Am I going to remember that? No, I'm not, because he just has a different time than we do. A day represents a year, Numbers 14, 34, and Ezekiel 4 to 6. Those are the two texts we use that say that in prophecy, a day represents a year. Does it say that in, in Numbers 14, 34? No, it doesn't. It does not say that a day represents a year in prophecy in Numbers 13, 14, 34. Nor does it say that in Ezekiel 4, 6. What's it say? It says that the Israelites spied out the land for 40 days, and they believed they would, couldn't go in there and take it, so God let them wander in the desert a year for every one of the days they spied out the land. That does not say that you can take that and put it to prophecy and make it work. Ezekiel was told to lay on his right side for 40 days in, in, as a symbol of the 40 years. It doesn't say anything. But when we take Daniel 8 and we apply a day to a, to a year, it works. Okay? A day of the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day from Second Peter. We don't believe it and it says it. A year represents a thousand years. Now, I went through this in, a, in one of the sermons I did with you guys. Maybe you probably forgot it. Uh, but it says a, a day represents a year, or D equals Y. A day equals a thousand years, if the prophecy in, in Peter is correct. So a day equals T Y. Well, simple algebra tells you that then a year has to equal a thousand years. Can we do that with numbers in the Bible? And when I do, I we'll go through it later. But when we did the sermon, we showed you Ellen White did it. And I didn't know that she had done that. And I found that we were going through the sermons and stuff. So anyway, that's what we have to have to get this whole week of time to work. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You've got to have these, these concepts here. So where is the promise coming? So we're in 2 Peter. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Who is doing that in our day today? 
those guys. Evolution starts with there is no God. And everything has always gone the same way it is today. It's always gone that way. You go into a cave, and I can never remember which it is, a stalactite or a stalagmite. And you have these little ways to remember. It's tight. It holds on to the ceiling. Or does it hold on to the floor? I, I don't know which one is which. But what they do is they measure this little tiny bit of chemical that lands on the top of that stalactite or stalagmite. And it only was this high and this wide. And this thing is this wide and it's 20 feet high. And so they figure out then that if only that much went on last year, then this thing is millions and millions of years old because there was no flood. There was nothing that happened that changed everything. Everything has always been the same. Okay? So these guys could be a group that believe that. But they will deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment of the destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. There it is. Don't forget that. It continues. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Now, we should probably know that and remember that, too. But the first response is, a day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. What's this text saying? Scoffers will say, where is the coming? They purposely forget the creation of God. They purposely forget the flood, and they will not believe in a future judgment. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises of coming again. The Lord is patient and wants everyone to come to repentance. The Lord, patience means salvation. What is this text saying? The Lord tells us not to forget something. You're going to get really tired of me saying that because I'm going to pound it in, right? What are we not supposed to forget? The day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. Now, here's what the SDA Bible commentary says in reference to these passages. In other words, the scoffers deliberately shut their eyes to the facts, but Christians should never fall into that grievous error. Okay, I believe that. That's, that's good. What facts? Well, it's creation, the flood, fiery judgment. Here it continues. The opening clause may be translated, but let not this one thing escape your notice, which in the NIV is this. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. The Lord tells us not to forget something. Have you figured it out yet? Just keep going over and over and over again. All right. Bible commentary again. Peter's thought is derived from the truth expressed in Psalms of David. So they think Peter picked it up from David when he made this statement. And we read it, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Here's the difference between David and Peter. The difference is you're supposed to remember it. Okay, Peter said not to forget it. As to your Bible commentary, God is eternal. With him there is no past, no future. All things are eternally present. I believe that. Has, he has no need of our limited concept of time. So what are they saying? They're saying that that means that his time is different from ours. Okay, and I still believe he has no need of our limited concept of time. So in other words, you don't need to remember the day that the Lord says it represents a thousand years. As the Bible commentary continues, and we cannot confine him or his ideas to our scale of days and years. So he's saying his days are different. We aren't going to confine him by saying a day represents a thousand years. But boy, do we confine him when we say a day is equal to a year. And we say that. How can you say a day is equal to a year and you can't say a day is equal to a thousand years? It doesn't make any sense. In stressing this truth, Peter is rebuking the skeptical impatience of the scoffers who, judging God by their own puny standards, doubt whether he will fulfill his promises connected with the end of the world. The context makes clear that Peter is not setting up a prophetic yardstick, and there it is. You cannot use this and apply it to the week of time and come up with something in which to measure the soon return of Christ. Okay, that's what they've just said. 
but computing time periods. Verse 7 deals with the fact that God has patiently awaited a day of judgment. Verse 9, he's long-suffering toward us. If one is trying to convince scoffers, remember this has to do with scoffers, that the second coming is going to happen because they're saying it's not going to happen. The argument that God is patient and wants everyone to be saved is not the way to do that because they're going to just throw it right back in your face. Their response will be simply to quote what was just said. If God is delaying, if, if God is delaying the second coming because he wants everyone to be saved, he is going to be waiting for a long, long time because the Bible says, and they're going to know what the Bible says, wide is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the road that goes to paradise and few there be that find it. So he's going to be waiting forever. That's not an argument to use to fix scoffers. The entire explanation of 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9 seems to be the editor's own interpretation. What do I mean by that? Again, they're theologians. They know what they're talking about. Uh, most cases, there are no texts other than Psalms 90, verse 4, and that agrees with a measurement idea, which says a thousand years of God's sight is like a day. It does not support their argument. There are no Greek words in the text that can be interpreted in some way to support their opinion. The Lord tells us not to forget something. We know what that is. The editors say the context, and this is where they, this is an opinion, folks. The context makes clear that Peter is not setting up prophetic yardstick for the computing of time. What do you mean the context is clear? You have no support from Greek. You have no other text. The text you have doesn't do the, what you want it to do. Peter says to remember it. God has no need of our limited concept of time. We cannot confine him or his ideas to our scale of days and years. Peter says, do you remember it? What if we look at it this way? We're about done. The scoffers are ignoring the facts. What facts are they ignoring? We went through it. They're ignoring the creation, the flood, and the fiery furnace, the future fiery uh, uh, judgment. But immediately afterward, it meant, after mentioning these three things, it tells us not to forget, to remember something, all right? So there it is again. I just overdid myself. The fact that God is patient, he wants everyone to be saved, he has promised to come again, supports what is to be remembered. But it is not that first thing. It was not what was to be remembered. So how does it fit? If one applies what was to be remembered, so the day is like a thousand years, a thousand years. If you take that application to what the scoffers are ignoring, the creation, the flood, and the judgment by fire, the text becomes complete and clear. What do I mean? The creation happened in how many days? Seven. Noah was in the ark how many days before the flood? Seven prior to the judgment of the world by water. To the Lord, from the fall of man to the judgment by fire, is seven days. A day to the Lord is a thousand years. Is it just coincidence that all these events that they ignore have something to do with days or a thousand years? They all are the same number, the number seven, three, seven, day periods. Seven days to create the world, seven days to judge the world by water, and seven symbolic days to judge the world by fire. God is patient, wants all men to be saved. God knows the day and hour of his coming. The amount of time that is necessary for man to choose to be saved or not is already planned. And that's what it's saying. It's saying that response to the scoffers He's got it all planned out because he planned out the creation, he planned out the destruction, and he's planning out the judgment at the end. Okay? And I'm going to quit because people are falling asleep, and I'm about to. <laughs> okay? All right. All right, let's have a closing prayer, and then we'll come back to this. We're doing this every Friday night. Uh, Jeremy is giving me this time period. So we only have 
uh, 437 pictures to go through. Okay. Yeah, we've gone through about 75, maybe. You know. Okay. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll have prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you've given us the word and uh, you help us understand it and we have all kinds of resources and we have all kinds of things that we can look up and, and see and that you have this thing planned out where you know the day and you know all these other different events that are coming down through time that we'll see later on. Lord, please continue to bless us. Help us to be drawn close to you. Keep us safe as we head home. In your name we ask it, amen.